Stories from the East and West. Hi, Leah. Hi, John. Happy to be here. Before we kick off this episode, let me ask you a hypothetical question. Sure. Imagine you live in a country that's being conquered and occupied by a totalitarian invader, and you want to hide and protect something valuable, some sort of good which could result in the death penalty for hiding and protecting. The question is, how and where would you hide it? Provided it's, it's something relatively little and not a nuclear weapon or anything, I think I would try to bury it in a remote location, like a forest. I'd probably do the same. I think most people would. But today, I'm going to tell you the story of some people who risked their lives, as well as the lives of their own children and friends, to hide and protect a very precious good in a huge city right under the nose of an absolutely ruthless enemy. Whoa, what kind of ruthless enemy are we talking about here? Nazi Germany. So it was in World War II Europe? In Warsaw, to be more precise. Wait, what was the precious good? Human life. Hi, I'm John. And I'm Leah. And this is Stories from the East and West. Today we're going to tell you the story of the Zabinski family. During World War II, even though it could have meant immediate execution at the hands of the Germans, the Zabinskis saved the lives of their Jewish friends, as well as Jewish strangers, by hiding them in their home in the middle of Warsaw Zoo. The place where it all happened is still there. It's the zoo director's house, and it has a fantastic name too, the Crazy Star Villa. We went to Crazy Star and met... Eva Strzewska and I work for the Pounder Foundation, so uh, the foundation that is taking care of the villa where we are right now. Every day, Eva gives people tours around the villa and tells them the story of the Zabinski family. Each time she tells the story, she does so in the most intriguing and beautiful way. So, obviously, we're going to let her tell the majority of what happened here. First, a few introductory words about the zoo's beginnings. The Warsaw Zoological Garden opened in 1928, but unfortunately, its first director died of pneumonia fairly soon after taking on the job, so... Surprisingly, a new director was necessary, so a new contest was uh, put up. And it was won by a very young tutor from the University of Sciences here in Warsaw. And um, it was won by uh, Jan Rabinski, thank you. It was a surprise because he was rather young for this position. So he moved here. Uh, he lived in the, on, the, on the zoo grounds with his wife, with Antonina Rabinska. Antonina Rabinska there. And remember that name as she plays a crucial part in this story. Well, they, they kind of soaked in the whole atmosphere, the whole place. They, they, they really enjoyed it and liked it. Um, and because it was a rule for the directors to live here, uh, soon there was a villa built. Um, they moved into this place where we are right now in 1931. The villa was partially destroyed during World War II, but is now fully rebuilt and absolutely charming. It is, and always has been, located in a very exposed place, just two minutes' walk from the zoo's gates. And immediately it became the Crazy Star Villa, because it was a crazy place. It was full of life, it was full of people, it was also full of uh, animals, not only little ones, not only birds like parrots, but also bigger ones, like, um, for example, the chimpanzee, who's become a friend of the family, but also uh, he was an accomplice of Jan because the chimpanzee was a heavy smoker, just like Jan Zabinski. So not only was the chimpanzee a smoker, but also a heavy smoker. Some crazy stuff going on at Crazy Star Villa. Indeed, and that's just the beginning. That was the times when uh, the Zabinski family um, had the possibility to bring up this zoo, to bring it to a national or, and then international level. It, become, it became back then recognised worldwide. So the times before the war were really, really happy ones. Um, the, the blooming boom, as we call it, of the 30s, the times when, when they really had uh, a lot of fun, not only work uh, that was recognised, but also fun, was somehow broken by the beginning of the World War II.
Nazi Germany attacked Poland on September 1, 1939. Poland was the first target subjected to a new military strategy called Blitzkrieg. It involved simultaneous attacks from air and land, with infantry backed up by heavy strafing and panzer tank divisions. Blitzkrieg meant that before German soldiers had even set foot in Warsaw, their planes had brutally bombed the place. When Warsaw was bombed, when also the zoo grounds were bombed, um, it was the times when um, you could actually meet a llama in the streets of Warsaw, because some of the animals managed, of course, to escape. The situation was really getting out of hand. Antonina Żabinska, the zoo director's wife, wrote in her diary. A half-ton bomb fell straight onto the polar bear's enclave, and these white bears, some of the world's most dangerous predators, were free to roam the streets. At any moment, the same thing could happen with the lion's pen, the tigers, the leopards. People in this city were already being bombed, and now another great danger could threaten them. There was only one way to prevent this from happening. Shoot all the predators. I went out onto the porch after it was done. Near the well, I saw a bunch of soldiers, a lieutenant, and some of the zoo staff. Everyone was silent. One of the caretakers was crying. Wow. But also some of them were taken away because they were really rare species or they had a certain value. For example, an elephant, a baby elephant, the first and so far the only one that was born in Poland in the zoo. And she was taken away to Germany. We don't really know what happened to her after that. So it all looked pretty devastating, I suppose. The onset of World War II ruined everything the Zhabinsky family had built during their 11 years running the zoo. The grounds were soon transformed into a park and allotments. The zoo premises themselves were turned into a pig farm intended to supply meat for the Nazi German army. A bad turn of events, maybe, but it did allow the family to stay at the zoo throughout the first years of the war. That sounds so surreal and heartbreaking. They showed no signs of giving up and immediately became involved with the underground resistance movement. At first it was just Jan, but the whole family became caught up in clandestine activities when they started sheltering people in danger, taking in activists and soldiers from the resistance movement at first. Even their six-year-old son, Richard, got involved in taking care of them. This is the moment when the great story uh, actually begins, because just before the whole um, difficult uh, times and the devastating times of war, uh, Jan met with his friend, and uh, that was um, a very famous uh, etymologist, Professor, uh, Professor Shimon Tendenbaum. And Professor Tendenbaum was a, a worldwide recognized etymologist, and he had a huge collection of insects and invertebrates on the whole, collected also here in the zoo grounds. Um, and he decided to give his collection to Jan Zabinski for safekeeping because he already knew that being a Jew meant something rather dangerous, let's say, during that times. Um, that's how the collection got here. Mm, and the T Tenenbaum family, uh, of course, was forced to move into, into the Warsaw Ghetto. And then, on October 15th, 1941, Hans Frank, the Nazi governor general of occupied Poland, issued a decree. Frank's new law said that any Jews attempting to leave the Warsaw Ghetto would be liable for the death penalty. In addition, the same punishment applied to anybody caught giving aid or shelter to Jews. You could be shot on the spot for doing something as trivial as simply giving them some food. One day, the villa was visited by a German soldier called Ziegler. Ziegler was a guy who was responsible for the Arbeitsamt uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, it appeared that he had spoken to Tenenbaum, and he himself was an etymologist amateur. And he learned from Tenenbaum that his collection is here, and he's come over to have a look at it. Jan Rabinski developed sort of strange relation with Ziegler. It was because on the level, of course, of humanity, it was impossible, but on the level of science, of biology, they somehow kind, they found a connection there. And Jabinski decided at some point, supposedly with his wife Antonina, who was a very strong-willed woman, to make use of it. 
and uh, he decided to visit Tenenbaum regularly and he told Ziegler that it's for the sake of the collection to ask how to preserve it, how to keep it and to speak about the nature. This way, uh, Jabinski received a special pass that allowed him to go in and out of the ghetto whenever he wanted to. And that's how he managed to help many, many Jewish people get out of the Warsaw Ghetto as such. He was able to go in on one side, then leave on the other with somebody else, or to hide somebody in a car and then just drive out. So Jan was going in and out of the Jewish ghetto? Because I thought that was absolutely impossible. We don't know how he did it. Antonina wrote in her diary that her husband used his will and charisma on one of the gatekeepers. At some point, the gatekeeper just stopped asking Jan who he was walking out with, didn't even ask for any papers. Even for his wife, the whole situation was beyond any comprehension. Antonina wrote, Today, when I remember that story with Ziegler, it seems surreal. Even then, it seemed impossible. We were terrified to think what might happen. We knew what horrifying things were going on at the Jewish Arbeitsamt, and it was Ziegler who was in charge there. That sounds like a strange relationship. Yes, it does seem unbelievable, doesn't it? That's why there's also a suspicion that Ziegler must have known about Jan's actions. But there's no evidence for it. It does seem logical, though, since saving that many Jews, and we're talking hundreds here, would have been pretty much impossible without the involvement of a high-ranking Nazi officer. But I don't see why Ziegler would be taking that risk, because it sounds as if there would be nothing in it for him. We simply don't know. It's one of the many mysteries of the crazy star villa and this story. We also don't know exactly how many people Jan led out of the ghetto, but we'll come back to that later. As for Tenenbaum, the Jewish etymologist... He led Tenenbaum's wife and daughter out, but Tenenbaum himself decided to stay in the ghetto to continue his work, and that's where he, where he died. Getting somebody out of the ghetto was one thing, but surviving after that was a whole new challenge. Jews were strictly forbidden from being outside the ghetto. Yeah, forbidden is a bit of an understatement because they were shot on sight if they got out. To put it bluntly. So to stop that happening, a ghetto SKP had to be equipped with forged documents confirming their non-Jewish identity. It was only then they could keep on moving. Staying in one place for too long was just simply too dangerous. Forging papers took weeks, so where did they go in the meantime? I'm guessing the zoo? Right. The zoo's villa turned into an interim shelter where ghetto fugitives could wait for their new papers. So just to be clear, Jan Jabinski was regularly taking Jewish people out of the heavily guarded ghetto? An act that doing just once made him and his family eligible for immediate execution? Then he'd hide them in his own house, located in the middle of the Warsaw Zoo, a place frequently visited by German Nazi soldiers in their free time, including Ziegler himself? Yes. And our zookeeper, would you believe it, was never caught. That's what I don't get about this story, though, the part about him not getting caught. Well, one practical thing was the hiding place. They adjusted the villa's basement and covered the door to it with a huge cupboard. Simple as that. From the outside, you couldn't really tell whether the house had a basement, so the occasional non-investigative visitor would never even think of it. They basically played a sort of psychological game with the Nazis. Here's what Antonina wrote about it in her diary. Our house was easily visible. To tell you the truth, anybody off the street could easily observe what was going on in our villa. And that was exactly what we were going for. For a German psyche, it was impossible to fathom that some sort of conspiracy might be taking place out in the open. That in mind, why ever bother going through the trouble of following us? And they came up with a very peculiar warning system. Whenever Antonina saw a Nazi um, officer come in close, she would sit by the piano and play. And she played an operetta by Offenbach, (laughs) Go to Crete, or Beautiful Helen, that's it. And the, the, the exact part of the operetta was Go to Crete.
they would hide if they were here in a in a in a villa because it's not like they were in the in the basement all the time. But that was the signal for them to hide. And if she played really quickly, really, really quickly, that was the signal for them that they need to leave the basement as well. And that uh, was done through a tunnel that's there in the basement. Eva took us down to the basement and showed us the tunnel. It's very unusual. You can hear by the reverb itself that it's very long. This is the place with the famous tunnel. As you can see, it's not, it's not very big. It's rather small. <laughs> or narrow, let's say, but it's very, very long with those metal little steps at the end. The tunnel allowed Jewish guests to walk in and out of the house unnoticed. And where did it come out? The entrance was, or the exit, depending on which side you look, was put uh, somewhere in between the cages uh, for birds, so the aviaries. And that's how, they, that, that's how they managed to survive, to hide all the time. And uh, she, and then Antonina played Chopin whenever it was safe. You know, even going there today, you can see how exposed the house is. People are just strolling around the zoo right by it. And the basement is a very typical one. It's not even deep or well hidden. When you visit and you hear Eva tell this story, you can start to feel the insecurity the Jewish fugitives must have felt. The number of times German soldiers must have been just feet away from them. It must have been one close shave after another. Exactly. Just imagine how many times they were seconds away from being discovered and killed. And the Zhabinskis themselves. They knew it was standard procedure to not only execute people who did anything to help Jews, but also their families. And the Zhabinskis had small children, remember? And still they did it. And they saved lots of people. We don't know how many exactly, since it was obviously safer to make sure there was no record of any of their guests. But experts estimate that it was around 300. Among them artists, scientists, even children who could miraculously stay quiet when necessary. When you think about how dangerous it was and how they provided this help without asking for anything in return, it makes you ask fundamental questions. I feel as if this sort of selflessness is almost unimaginable nowadays. Like it would be a big story if you took in one person at no personal risk and here they took in 300 people and they would get a death sentence if they were caught. Exactly. To what extent can or should people risk their lives when trying to save the lives of others? Yeah, well, that's a tough question. The story of the Crazy Star Villa does stand out among these sorts of heroic histories, since it was extreme in many ways. But it's certainly not the only one. Here are two experts on the subject. Hello, my name is Clara Jekl. I work at the Polin Museum of the History of Polish Jews, and I'm responsible for an online project which is dedicated to Polish righteous among the nations. The project is called Polish Righteous Recalling Forgotten History. And... Karolina Dzienczałowska. I cooperate with the Museum of the History of Polish Jews and uh, I am an author of um, virtual exhibitions uh, for the project uh, about Righteous Among the Nations. So who are the Righteous Among the Nations? Righteous Among the Nations are people who are non-Jews and who selflessly provided help uh, to persecuted Jews during the World War II, risking their lives, their professional position or their freedom. Uh, the title of uh, Righteous Among the Nations has been awarded by the State of Israel since 1963. And so far, more than 26,000 of people from all over the world uh, were honored with this title, uh, including uh, more than 6,000 Poles. As for the Zhabinsky family, they were bestowed the title in 1968. Speaking about them with our experts from Pauline, Clara revealed a whole new dimension to the danger they were facing on a day-to-day -day basis. As I said, it was forbidden to give any help, and Germans even granted denunciating Poles who were giving uh, help and denunciating Jews. So the Nazis were encouraging Poles to report Jews in hiding. So people who decided to do that uh, were acting under extreme conditions in complete secrecy because they, were, they had to hide this fact also, also from their Polish neighbours 
uh, because there was a chance, there was a possibility they, that they could denunciate them to the Germans because of different reasons, because of uh, fear as well. So the situation in Poland was very, uh, was very special, very, very difficult. And um, danger lurked around every corner in Warsaw. Any passerby could have ended the whole thing there and then. But the Zhabinskis somehow overcame their fear of this, and it seems they tried to help their Jewish guests overcome theirs too. What do you mean by that? Not only did they rescue people, but they also did their best to reduce the horror of war by asking them to participate in everyday life at the Crazy Star. They even organized a tiny art studio in the basement. It was used by Magdalena Gross, a famous Polish-Jewish sculptor who stayed there for seven months, the longest documented stay at the villa. Did they keep going until the end of the war? Not quite. Jan was called up when the Warsaw Uprising began in August 1944. He was captured during its last days in October and sent to a prisoner of war camp. Antonina left Warsaw after the fall of the uprising, but returned to the villa eight months later when the war finally ended. The Szabinskis never regained their positions as zookeepers, but they did remain very active in promoting animal awareness. Jan worked at Polish National Radio, and Antonina devoted her life to writing books about animals. She also published her diary, which was one of the main sources for this episode. The weird thing is, though, that story is so spectacular and heroic that even though I know rationally that it happened, I can't quite wrap my head around it. And it seems you're not the only one, Leia. But the most interesting part for everybody is how on earth was this possible? Yeah, yeah. Everybody asks the same question, how? <laughs> um, it's probably, probably a mystery. Mm, and those who have never been to war would probably not see or understand. So I like to say that let's just praise that there were, you know, people like that. Let's let's be happy and um, grateful that we do have people like this. And let's hope that if anything happens to us <laughs> like that, we would have somebody like Jabinski, like Jan and Antonina somewhere close, because they did make a difference. And it doesn't happen every day, I suppose. I think that with every exhibition, every story that we tell, we are asking uh, ourselves question why uh, why uh, those people start to act, and I think uh, that uh, this question is very important for us to think about the answer. Maybe with, with an answer to this question, we, we can learn how to become from a bystander to upstander. I think it was Jan that said, I am not sure what is it that you're so surprised at. It was so natural. It was something that we do for other people because uh, I just cannot stand how the Germans treated the Jews. And it's not about the Jewish cause as such, I would have done the same thing for the Germans if it was, if it had been the other way around. For him, it was an act of being a human. That's it. That's how he sees this, or saw it, yeah? Mm -hmm. Just like that. This episode of Stories from the East and West was a Wirewalker studio production for Culture.pl. Our team included Wojciech Oleksiak, Adam Żuławski, John Beecham, Nitzan Reisner, Leo Berio, and our intern, Veronica Fay. A big thanks to Ewa Strzyżewska, Clara Jakl, and Karolina Dzięciołowska for joining us on this episode. We'd also like to thank Panda Foundation and the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews for all their help. The name for the Panda Foundation in Polish is Fundacja Rozwoju Warszawskiego Ogrodu Zoologicznego Panda. You can find links to their websites in the show notes. To see the notes from this episode, just tap the show art in your podcast app or visit storiesfromtheeastandwest.com. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to subscribe for future episodes. And remember to give us a review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help others find the podcast too.